Uh, I can see questions coming into the Q&A and we're going to do uh, another session um, now to uh, to just sort of give you an opportunity to pose or for John to pose your questions that you've put into the chat to into the Q&A rather to the panellists from this afternoon. So I'll hand over to John uh, and uh, we'll see what questions have come up. Thank you, John. Okay, thank you. No dog this time. Um, so I've got a question here from John Holland to um, Sean. And uh, it's, his question is, what about IPM and weeds? And that many best officials rely on weeds for cover and food. And is the way that they can be managed in an acceptable way? Yeah, it's, it's quite complicated with weeds, um, not least because uh, one of the consequences of losing so many active ingredients means that we are, we've moved away from the ability to target individual weeds and we're left with a portfolio of herbicides, which are so broad spectrum that we tend to get a lot of collateral damage really. And also because of our lack of herbicides for post-emergent use, we're relying on a lot of pre -em herbicides. So we're probably controlling things we've no need to control. And uh, it's a real difficult one for me as an agronomist. I don't approve of recreational spraying. I never have done. I don't see the point of trying to control weeds that are low down in the canopy um, when they're not um, competitive or anything else. So um, there are certain weeds I will control through the season, but I would prefer to leave a proportion of things like knotgrass, speedwells, pansies low down in the base of the crop, which aren't doing me any harm, leave them in the crop. But again, if you're going to take that approach, there is a real relationship that you have to have with a grower because, you know, you don't want to slap wrist for leaving dirty stubbles and it has to be it has to be a two-way street but as i've said before it's all in you have to we have to accept that because of our loss of active ingredients we're left with a smaller portfolio which are far more broad spectrum and that particular conundrum is becoming more and more difficult to to um to work with really and and i suppose that there's um i think another question from Alan Horgan here to, to Andy and it says how do you make the judgment balance between encouraging beneficials yet encouraging slugs at the same time I suppose it goes back to the weeds issue being there for cover and food possibly also being a, a, a problem with slugs you got any thoughts on that Andy well that's that's what we struggled with for a while and um, that's hence I showed that picture you know you, you have to keep working things out don't you and, and that's the uh, latest tool we've got that manages to do extremely shallow cultivation seems to get that balance because you're still leaving you're still leaving stalks stuck up you know so you can still get uh, you can still get the money spider webs in in the following week but you are damaging the slugs as well so uh, it is a balance and I guess you you know it's how much you're worried about one or the other as well about where you want to do more cultivation or 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 less but we at the moment and i say at the moment because you saw all the examples i gave <laughs> of how sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't it, it, it that that struck a good balance okay thanks for that then um and actually there's another question here for you andy and and it says uh, it's from rob nightingale uh, do you think there's a challenge in adopting a, a lot of techniques as we tend to try perhaps changing one or two things at a time so then dismiss techniques as not working so companion crops because they haven't worked alone and they need multiple elements to work well and some work better than others in some years. Now, just from my personal perspective, um, I remember how Van Emden saying that IPM is an accumulation of, of lots of little changes, a bit like the uh, Dave Brailsford model for improving performance in, in a cycling team. It's only when you get all of those together that you really see the, the final outcome and, and one on its own just doesn't really work and you would dismiss it. Is that something you found? Yeah, completely. That that's entirely what I think. And you, we are we are in that stage of just stacking and stacking and stacking and stacking. And it's impossible for me. It's one of my frustrations. You know, I haven't got enough harvest left in me to try every single thing on its own, every single time. And I have to, uh, although I'm a scientist by background and I want actual evidence every time. Sometimes you have to. Uh, that's where the art of farming comes in, I guess. And you you have to think what you feel works as well but also we need more research on it don't we we've this is a common theme it's been going on for years we hear it in all of these uh these meetings it you know we we bring out some legislation saying you've got to 
you've got to put IPM in place and, and yet we don't fund the research into the IPM. So we need a bit more joined up thinking. I need a lot more information. All farmers need a lot more information um, from the researchers about how, how it's benefited and, and the benefits to uptaking IPM. Because at the moment, you know, a lot of people, I, I'm all for it and a lot of farmers are. And, and Sean is, and people, and, and independent agronomists are, but if you haven't got the evidence there, you know, you can see risk. That's what you see, you see risk. So it's a bit of a leap of faith sometimes. So we need that that evidence to come forward. Okay, and, and actually, I think um, Chris has made quite a good point in the uh, question and answers um, section of the, of the Zoom chat, whatever we are. Um, it's not it's not so much a question it's it's more of a, a statement and a plea I think for ensuring that we make best use of of capturing the information around implementation of IPM um, and understanding the national position so we know that changes occur and things are, are going forward um, sorry if I paraphrase that a bit incompletely uh, Chris and um, so uh, one, one of the other things here I suppose is is um, going back to you Mark it this translation or using of models from one place to another, and, and I guess it comes back to IPM in general, but how or what work is being done on redefining thresholds or, or even defining thresholds, as Andy might point out, that some are um, perhaps not as robust as we might wish. Is, is, is there something going on alongside uh, your, the projects you've got, or is that just being left to um, local uh, research being done in the country? So um, there's kind of two two bits I'll answer there. The, the first is around um, the need for research. And I just wanted to kind of sort of start off from where what, a point that Andy made that we do need more research, but we also need to make sure that it's it's really at the applied end. There are a lot of solutions out there. There's a lot of IPM tactics out there, um, but quite often they were developed, understandably, at a quite a broad level, and uh, they don't apply to every farm in the same way. And so one of the problems is we have all these tools, but they need to be considered at a farm level on each case. And really that was one of the problems with, with the thresholds, that they were oversimplified um, in order to be somewhat effective everywhere rather than actually effective anywhere. And so we end up with these thresholds that don't really have a clear scientific basis and um, they are based on good science but they they aren't they aren't defined as such and i think you know andy you made the point that they haven't been peer reviewed and we don't really know where some of these things came from um and and so they have this kind of broad approach therefore they're useful really to no one so there's a lot more research to try and make these if we just take thresholds as an example try and make them more adaptable to specific locations um, and I'll just pick up on the, the pollen beetle one because, Andy, the one you described is an outdated one that, that ADAS have created a new one that is a, um, reflects crop density. And in that way, it's trying to fit better with what's actually going on on the farm. And I think we're going to see more of those kind of thresholds coming through where they better incorporate on-farm situations rather than being a generic guide um, really that doesn't apply anywhere. In terms of uh, adapting things, I mean, there's, there's a lot going on in the two projects that I, I've mentioned and a lot in other projects as well. And there's a wide recognition that thresholds and forecasts are useful tools to farmers, but again, they, they are still too generic to really help um, everyone. And so the, that's what we're trying to do is get them to a position where they can be adapted and can be uh, more applicable. I'm sure made a, made a really good point that ultimately they are only guides. It doesn't matter how good the system is, at the end of it, a farmer has to make a decision based on that information. And so the best we can do is make sure that that information is presented in a nice, straightforward way, uh, in a trustworthy way, and that the assumptions and any limitations are really clear so that that's a, a properly informed decision rather than just a, an indication of it's hit the threshold, it's over to you now. Um, which I think a lot of the, the current ones are um, fall into the trap of. I don't know if that answers your your question, John, but it's uh, it, yeah, as, as it's coming out in all. Yeah, these, I, 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 I think it does. Yes, thank you. Um, so I, I there's, there's there aren't many more questions come in particularly. There was one question from Alan Horgan: How do you manage a wildflower strip to flower longer than say six weeks in the year? 
And actually, there's a response from John Holland on that. Um, but I think that, you know, you, you, you can do it with the right selection of seeds and plant species. Um, uh, some will flower earlier and some later and, and maybe intermediate mowing at some stages as well. Um, I don't know whether, Andy, do you want to say anything about that? Have you managed to have continual flowering through the whole season? No, I mean, it's it's hard enough getting them established <laughs> to start with. <laughs> right then. No, it's tricky. That's what. That's why it's, you know, you won't see, if you drive around the whole of Kent, you probably won't see any other infield flower strips in, in cereals anyway, because it's, it's not easy. You know, we only, we managed to do it with the advent of RTK actually, because you have to get them in between the tram lines. So we need guidance for a start. Uh, and, um, there is advice out there, which was someone alluded to earlier, I think there's a link put up um, about the managing of, of, of wildflower strips and perhaps we need our, um, you know, our agronomists, I'm sure Sean knows all about it, but that, you know, perhaps some agronomists are not used to being asked questions about how to uh, agronomy of their wildflower strips. Uh, so the, the more we know about them, the better, but I'm still, I'm still learning on a steep learning curve. Okay. John, I'll oh. jump in because um, we did a, there was an AHDP project the last couple of years where we've been looking at infield flower strips uh, i mean i haven't got very much more to add to andy because it, it was all the same things came through the the key and, and as john said in the chat the key is you, you've got to select your, your species to fit where you're putting things in um, and usually the seed mixes you get have quite a range of things in there in the hope that something will work um, and some things work in different years it, but it really is a trial and error and i don't think anyone's got a, a prescription and it's the same issue as, as I mentioned before these things are bespoke to farm so you've got to have a go see what works and sort of get rid of the stuff that didn't and build on the stuff that did and just find what works best for you on your farm. Okay thanks for that. Sean did you have anything to add in your extensive knowledge of establishing wildflower strips? No I th but I think as an agronomist it, it's just another crop it's just you, yeah. uh, uh, you just try and learn as much about these things as you can but as Andy said and as Mark said you know that the, the problem with wildflower they're a bit like sheep they just they'll die for no reason whatsoever <laughs> and you've no idea why they died and it all comes back to the whole premise that I think our whole job whether you're a farmer or an advisor it's it's 80 percent luck and 20 percent skill the problem is if you haven't got the 20%, you shouldn't bother trying in the first place, but that 80% sometimes extends up to about 99%. So we're pretty much in the dark. All you can do is learn as much as you can about the subject and try and apply it and learn from mistakes. That's pretty much how it works, I think. Just a question to you then, Sean. Do you, do you think that IPM is, is inherently more risky than what we have been doing in the past um does it have to be that or or is it a question of uh you know if you wanted to look at risk mitigation and some way of underwriting the additional risk that farmers face going down the ipm route or more intensive ipm route um what what would be your feeling on that well i, I you have to look at it in context so where we're using plant protection products ultimately somebody's responsible for a claim on a can that this is going to do this it will kill this weed and it won't kill that weed but it will do this and it will do that when it doesn't work you get the people who made it in to explain themselves and they bear the responsibility if it didn't work we've seen more and more um, of our job um, moving towards extensions of authorization for mining use so an awful lot of the risk from a lot of um, plant protection products is now out of the hands of manufacturers and firmly on the shoulders of growers themselves. I think the biggest, the thing that holds back growers so much when it comes to relying upon IPM is that we've said it, all three of us have said it, there's nobody culpable if it goes wrong and that litigious mentality is something that farmers and agronomists like struggle to get hold of. There's always the thought in the back of the head, well IPM says this but if I put that on, it's only cheap, it'll solve that. And then nobody can come back on me. And I've seen it several times this year where wrong decisions have been made um, on farms that I share with other agronomists. And I know those other agronomists are making a mistake because it's not the right decision to take, but it's an opinion. That's the problem. Everything's down to trust. We can't, you know, before you criticise someone, walk a mile in their shoes. We can only do what our gut tells us to do. And how how big and made of steel our balls are sometimes, I'm afraid. And I think IPM, 
lends itself to falling back on other methods of doing the job. That's why I said at the beginning of my piece, you pretty much have to be all in. If you're going to go for IBM, you've got to embrace it and you have to rely on it to do some good. But I think it's the whole problem that nobody is culpable other than probably the agronomist that's giving you the advice not to spray based on an IPM protocol. Okay, thanks for that. And um, Anna, I think you're still there. Um, uh, you're, you're obviously um, from DEFRA. Given that, uh, you know, this, this, this willingness to, I guess, um, make a decision that's that's perhaps a bit contrary to, to what you've experienced in the past and, and advisors having to put their, um, I guess, their, their neck on the line. Is there any any room, do you think, with anything that's going on in government to, to reduce that risk or to underwrite that risk in some way in order to hasten the transition to a, a more intensive use of IPM? Hi, John. Yeah, thank you. And um, I have to admit, my, I have my daughter at home with COVID, so I did pop away uh, briefly <laughs> just, for, just at the end there. Um, I think, so Paddy may want to come in, who may have heard more. I think um, we probably go back to the discussion earlier on recognising that changes in decision making, you know, are will be driven by economics. And that's why I suppose we're really focusing at the moment on the development of the IPM standard as part of the SFI. I think that's the first stage, but that may not be, you know, acknowledged that may, that may not be enough. And there may be other financial incentives that we need to, to look at in this space. But yeah, sorry, sorry if that's not a full answer. If I didn't, didn't hear everything that was mentioned. I see Paddy's appeared, so maybe he's got something to add. I thought just to pop on there, I think we are obviously considering, um, you know, how advice fits in with all of these mechanisms, whether that's the, the standard or the other things we've identified in the toolbox work uh, and, and, and other policies uh, and work beyond that. Um, and are really keen to work with, with everyone, uh, you know, the experts within those fields to understand the barriers for both the farmers and for advisors. So I think those you know, there's a lot more of those conversations to be had in, in the near future to make sure this all comes together in, in a right way. But, but yeah, I think Anna's right in saying that um, in the first instance, this kind of first suite of actions on, on government's part will focus more on the farmer, but, but we can, but these conversations are, are to be developed still. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I haven't seen any more questions pop up, so um, I could go on talking, but that would be boring for everybody, I'm sure. Um, so I will hand back to Catherine, who may just give us a quick synopsis, but um, as uh, chair of this group, I'd just like to thank everybody for contributing. Um, it's been a very interesting day um, on many levels. Um, so thank you for that, and uh, back to Catherine. Thank you, John. Um, I just did have a message in the chat saying that uh, from Alan, uh, just saying that he was struggling to put a question in and I don't into the Q&A area. And I don't know whether others have experienced that as well. No. today. So apologies if that has been the case. Um, but um, uh, if there's something that you desperately needed to ask, then please do put something in the chat and I'll try and pick it up while we're just speaking now. Um, so really, uh, just to re reiterate what John has said, I think Today's presentations and, and the, the, the structure that we've had today has really been very useful in helping us to think about where we are with IPM and, uh, and what the challenges still are. So we, we heard from the, you know, from the scientists that are working on, on lots of different areas and those, uh, the tools that are being made available all excellent work and, and really sort of taken us in the direction of travel that we need to be going, but still uh, lots to go. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, you know, the experiences that we heard from, particularly from uh, Andy at the end there, who's clearly, you know, really uh, passionate and, and tries so many things to try and make his IPM work, but is still hitting challenges. And I think that the, the phrase that's kept popping up throughout the day is we need more, more research and we need to do that research. We need money to do that research. So I think that that's uh, definitely something that I'm sure um, Anna and Paddy will be going away with and, and sort of keeping in mind, hopefully, um, because without that, then uh, that does make sort of rolling out IPM as, as, as 
the government wants us to do, as DEFRA wants us to do, as well as what farmers want to do and, and agronomists want to see happen, uh, isn't really going to be possible in an effective and, and cost efficient way um, for us to be able to produce our food um, well in this country and, and sa as safely as we want to. So I, I think I'm, I'm blown away by the presentations today. I mean, this isn't, as John said earlier on, this isn't my area of expertise. Uh, at all, but um, they've been really interesting and, and such a lot of, of really useful detail and information. So thank you to all of the speakers today um, and also for the questions that have come into the um, to the Q&A where we've been able to do that and um, and, and sort of been able to, to sort of get back and get a, a bit more detail where that's been needed. I uh, also want to thank all of the sponsors for today uh, who are um, sort of shown, been shown up on the, the slides that where we've um, broken for different breaks during the day. Um, without them um, being able to sponsor this event, then it really wouldn't happen. Um, so that's uh, you know, a big thank you to them. But also thank you to all of the delegates that have come along and, and listened in. Uh, we've had sort of 80 plus most of the day. Um, and that's really uh, impressive, I think, and, and really shows the... Um, the level of interest and commitment um, from people who really want to learn more and, and how well to how best to um, to use some of these tools and, and the research that's that's coming out and, and how we can implement that better. So thank you all once again um, and um, hope you I can't even say have a, a safe journey home because <laughs> clearly some of you are already at home and uh, I have to say that <laughs> I've seen two um, two backgrounds today that are very impressive so Alan Dewar and Anna Morgan's beautiful plants in their um, in the areas where they're working have been uh, very um, impressive to me so uh, that was uh, nice to see as well so thank you all again thank you for the day and um, hope you've enjoyed and got something from it. Thanks very much Catherine. You're welcome. Excellent. Thank you very much, Catherine and, and John, for keeping everything going and all the uh, all the presenters. Excellent. Thank you very much. Welcome. Cheerio. Safe journey back. Thanks, Julian. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Okay, see you, Andy. Cheers. Bye. Yeah. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>